All right, Dr. Ramshandani, come on up here. Um, she's going to talk to us about uh, severe TR and surgical approaches. There are now more than 900 videos on the Debakey Education channel, uh, which was pointed out to me when I was in China a few days ago at a meeting. Uh, a surgeon came up to me and said, um, <clears throat> you don't know me, but I know you. Uh, and uh, what he'd done was he, he, he had downloaded using a VPN, <clears throat> because you don't have open access to YouTube or Google in China, but using a VPN, he had downloaded 930 videos from the Debakey Education Channel, which is the total number that's out there. And he plays them in his room, using a projector on the wall, um, every night, and shares it with his Chinese colleagues. And um, so that was really quite a revelation. So you will have access to it, too. And <clears throat> you won't need a VPN to get to it. So I've been asked to speak about uh, the surgical approach um, to severe tricuspid regurgitation, or when to intervene with severe tricuspid regurgitation. A little bit of an anatomy lesson first. The tricuspid valve is the most caudal, um, is, is my pointer gonna work here? Yeah. Is the most caudally placed of all four valves in the heart, and here you see a cutaway of the right ventricle, um, uh, which, uh, which shows uh, the tricuspid valve. Uh, right about here. There are three leaflets to the tricuspid valve. There's the septal leaflet, um, uh, the, the, uh, the anterior leaflet, and the smallest of all, the posterior leaflet. And I'll show you a little bit more about the anatomy in just a second because it's very relevant uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to any surgical intervention uh, on the tricuspid valve. Uh, there are typically three papillary muscles in the right ventricle. Each of them typically has got three heads, and each papillary muscle is typically attached to two of the three leaflets. Um, so this is a view from above, looking down at the, at the, at the four valves uh, in the heart. This is the aortic valve over here. That's the mitral valve. And this is the tricuspid valve, with the pulmonic valve being located over here. Now, this is the central fibrous body of the heart over here, which is the right fibrous trigone called the central fibrous body because, in fact, it links the aortic valve, the mitral valve, and the tricuspid valve. The left fibrous trigone is seen over here. And what's relevant in this case is that the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve is attached to the central fibrous body or the right fibrous trigone um, of the heart. And through that, in that area of the right fibrous trigone, uh, runs the atrioventricular node, which is relevant, and you will see why that is so in just a moment. So this is sort of a cutaway version of it. The aortic valve is seen over here with the right coronary artery coming off and the left coronary artery coming off there. Uh, you've got the mitral valve or the curtain of the mitral valve over here um, uh, with the interleaflet triangle uh, uh, located up over here. And what's uh, uh, the subject of the talk here, the mitral, I mean, excuse me, the tricuspid valve over here with the septal leaflet attached here. Now, when you look through the right atrium um, at the tricuspid valve, and this is uh, a patient in whom the head is located on the left over here and the feet to the right. So this is the view the surgeon would get when you're looking in the right atrium. <clears throat> you're looking at the tricuspid valve over here. A couple of features to note this drawing accurately depicts the attachment of each papillary muscle to two leaflets. Uh, but what's relevant here is to look at the other features in the atrium. Here is the fossa ovalis because behind this area here is the interatrial septum. So going through the fossa ovalis will take you through to the left atrium. But in the right atrium itself, you've got this thing called the triangle of coke, which every surgeon is aware of. Um, it's bounded by the coronary sinus over here, which is where the venous drainage of the heart comes into the right atrium. Um, the so-called tendon of Todaro, which is a fold at the inferior aspect of the coronary sinus. And this part of the isosceles triangle is the septal leaflet, or the annular aspect of the septal leaflet. And at the apex of this isosceles triangle, the triangle of Koch, is more or less where the AV node is located. So when you do surgery on the tricuspid valve, and I'll show you a one minute video that demonstrates how, um, 
how a tricuspid ring is put in, you really want to avoid this area. And so in practice, what we end up doing is placing sutures from six o'clock, which is roughly where the S uh, letter is over here, to nine o'clock, avoiding this zone completely uh, to, uh, to minimize the risk of AV injury. Now, tricuspid valve surgery, if there's no interatrial communication, can be done on the beating heart. I won't show you an example of that, but we do it very commonly on the beating heart because you can open the right atrium and the heart's beating away and there's no, there's no risk of introducing air to the left side as long as you don't have an ASD or a patent foramen ovale or something like that. The advantage of doing that is that if the patient's in sinus rhythm and you place a stitch in the AV node, they'll go into block the moment you put your needle in and you can take your needle out. So the general point though is that you need to avoid this uh, uh, nine o'clock to six o'clock area when you are performing a tricuspid valve annuloplasty. It becomes more difficult to do so when you're doing a tricuspid valve replacement because you do need to have sutures in that area but you need to be extremely careful to place them superficially and of course accept and explain to the patient ahead of time that the risk of inducing block which will require a pacemaker is much higher if they're going to need a tricuspid valve replacement. So this is an actual uh, anatomic uh, depiction of that where you see the posterior leaflet located on the right hand side as the surgeon looks at it and the smallest of the three leaflets with the triangle of cope drawn in over here bounded by the coronary sinus, the septal leaflet and the, um, um, the tendon of Todaro. So, tricuspid regurgitation occurs most commonly because of a functional reason, secondary to left-sided disease. You get pulmonary hypertension leading to right ventricular dilatation uh, and the tricuspid annulus dilates. But there are other reasons why it can dilate. RV dilatation or dysfunction can occur directly as a result of left ventricular dilatation in ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. The circumflex of the annulus lengthens primarily along the attachments of the anterior and the posterior leaflets. And I'll show you a diagram that illustrates that. And the reason for this is that the septal leaflet, as I said earlier, is attached to the central fibrous body of the heart. So it's fixed in position that it can't dilate. The dilatation therefore occurs uh, on the anterior and posterior sides, which are attached uh, to the free wall of the right ventricle, which dilates. The septal leaflet, uh, as we just mentioned. So as annular and ventricular dilation progresses, the chordal papillary muscle complex becomes shortened and the valve loses its saddle shape. It too has a saddle shape just like the mitral valve. And so you don't get proper leaflet apposition, you get a dilated valve which is flattened out uh, resulting in severe, uh, in, in, in a degree of valvular incompetence. Now there are other causes of tricuspid regurgitation and we won't, and I only, and I point them out over here only to mention them because we'll really be talking about the treatment of secondary uh, tricuspid regurgitation. So you can have it secondary to uh, primary pulmonary hypertension, Marfan's, uh, blunt trauma, dilated cardiomyopathy in the late stages, endocarditis, carcinoid and rheumatic disease to name a few. So, Cut away the valves and we're looking again at the fibrous skeleton of the heart. This is just to explain to you why the valve dilates in the direction that it does. And as, and as you see over here, this is the tricuspid annulus. And this is the central fibrous body uh, with the septal leaflet being attached to this portion over here. And that's why you don't get dilatation in this segment, but you get it in this area here. So the tricuspid valve dilates uh, in the direction of the anterior and posterior leaflets, and that's where you would see the greatest increase in dimension. My understanding, and I hope I'm right in saying this, Steve, is that most commonly um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the measurement of the uh, maximum diameter of the tricuspid annulus is made in the, on the preoperative transthoracic echo and the four-chamber view in end diastole. Now, for the tricuspid valve to leak, uh, the tricuspid annulus and hence the right ventricle has to be dilated. But in addition to tricuspid dilatation, there are three important factors which determine whether tricuspid regurgitation occurs. Preload, afterload, and RV function. So because 
the volume loading conditions of the heart affect the degree of tricuspid regurgitation, there has been and still is a general reluctance to address tricuspid regurgitation unless it's very severe because we say to ourselves, well, if you manage the patient's volume status optimally, you'll be able to control the amount of TR. That may or may not be true. There's a growing feeling that once the tricuspid annulus dilates, uh, it's not going to go back to a normal size. And if you're in there fixing a left-sided lesion, you should probably address the, the tricuspid valve as well. The clinical presentation is well known to you, uh, fatigue and weakness with right heart failure and in late stages, cachexia, cyanosis, and jaundice. And so the question is when to address it surgically. So in 1967, this paper by Nina Brownwald uh, suggested that it really wasn't necessary to address the right-sided or the tricuspid lesion um, uh, in patients who were having uh, mitral valve surgery. Fast forward to 1984, um, and uh, uh, Dr. Schaff, who's a co-author of this paper, um, uh, says, suggested uh, that perhaps it wouldn't be a bad idea to uh, address uh, tricuspid valve regurgitation when you were there fixing the left side. And it was really more a gestalt without any evidence uh, to, uh, uh, to support it one way or the other. Um, really, the most, uh, in the modern era, I would say, the, uh, the, the push towards being more aggressive for tricuspid valve repair started with this paper uh, by Gilles Dreyfus uh, that, uh, from Harefield, uh, uh, and, the, uh, uh, um, and the National Heart in London, um, where uh, they, they looked at two groups of patients that were undergoing mitral valve procedures um, and, um, and grouped them in, well, and, uh, at two groups of patients that were undergoing mitral valve procedures, all of whom had dilated tricuspid annuli. In one group, uh, they repaired the tricuspid valve, um, and in another group, they didn't. The criteria that they used for tricuspid dilatation was very generous by, 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 by standards today. They were looking at patients that had a tricuspid annulus of 70 millimeters or greater, uh, 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 irrespective of the degree of tricuspid regurgitation. And what they showed, uh, essentially, um, is, is that uh, at a mean follow-up of 4.8 years, uh, they showed, as you can see in the top line, that the um, uh, heart failure, New York Heart Association uh, classification of these patients uh, that had tricuspid valve repair was markedly reduced, um, and the reduction in tricuspid regurgitation grade at 4.8 years was also markedly reduced. Um, so their suggestion was that irrespective of the degree of tricuspid regurgitation, if the tricuspid annulus was dilated, um, that it should be repaired if you were addressing a left-sided lesion. Um, this paper uh, uh, from 2012 uh, in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery uh, suggested that prophylactic tricuspid valve repair in patients with an annulus greater than 40 millimeters um, and less than two plus TR. So using annular dilatation as your primary marker uh, improved RV remodeling and had better functional outcomes. Um, another paper in 2015 uh, suggested that uh, if you didn't repair tricuspid valve uh, uh, at the time of left-sided surgery, by 10 years, patients uh, but more than 50% of patients would have a worsening of tricuspid regurgitation grade by at least two grades. Um, so, so this was a paper that came out of the Mayo Clinic in 2011 that really served, I think, to highlight the fact that tricuspid, secondary tricuspid regurgitation um, varies depending upon the etiology of the left-sided disease. And they were looking at the Mayo Clinic uh, at, at, uh, at patients um, who, uh, uh, who had functional tricuspid regurgitation at the time of mitral valve repair for degenerative leaflet prolapse. So excluding patients with ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, excluding patients with rheumatic etiologies. And what they said basically was that uh, there was no progression of TR in these patients and you, uh, and you didn't need to address it. Um, however, this paper uh, that, uh, that, uh, that came out uh, from uh, Stanford and Penn uh, in 2014 
uh, uh, showed that in patients who had some degree of tricuspid regurgitation at the time of mitral valve surgery, if nothing was done, uh, by eight years, you had a significant worsening in TR and New York Heart Association uh, functional class um, if, if, if you hadn't addressed it in the, in the first place. And this, in fact, has been incorporated to some degree in the guidelines. But it's by no means clear um, um, uh, still as to which specific subgroup of patients with TR at the time of uh, uh, left-sided surgery should have a tricuspid annuloplasty. There's no question that the shift is occurring towards being more aggressive, and, and, uh, and, and I'll explain why in just a moment. So this was another editorial by Pat McCarthy where he suggested perhaps time had come uh, for us to be more aggressive, and um, uh, Tyrone David suggested the same in this article uh, in 2015. So functional tricuspid, fu functional TR we, um, um, we, we thought would regress after fixing left-sided lesions. We now know that this is frequently not so. We also know that the progression of TR varies with etiology, probably worse in patients with rheumatic disease and dilated cardiomyopathies versus degenerative mitral valve disease. We also know that uncorrected TR probably increases both post-op morbidity and mortality and is associated with poorer long-term results, no surprise perhaps. And most importantly, I think for surgeons, tricuspid annuloplasty at the time of, of left-sided surgery adds very little risk to the procedure. It's a very straightforward thing to do and redo surgery for tricuspid regurgitation in patients who may develop severe TR down the line that, that you may think needs reintervention, in fact, has a very high mortality. So what are the options for tricuspid repair? You can do an annular application uh, or you can do a reduction or remodeling uh, annuloplasty using a flexible ring or a rigid band. Uh, you need to ensure that you get leaflet coaptation and mobility. You have to stabilize the annulus and avoid conduction injury. So this is, a, this is an example of, uh, of bicuspidization. You remember the three cusps, there's the septal leaflet, there's the anterior leaflet, and there's the small posterior leaflet. Uh, essentially, this procedure involves uh, imbricating the posterior leaflet, um, as, as shown over here, where you you go from this, where you've got three leaflets, to this, where you've just got two leaflets, effectively performing a reduction annuloplasty by pinching off, pinching off that side of the valve. This is something which is quick and easy to do and is sometimes done in patients who have a heart transplant, for example, that may have TR. You can go in and just put, a, uh, put an annular application stitch over there. Um, I'm not sure that this is a very durable way of achieving uh, what you want to uh, because this is the part of the annulus that is part of the RV free wall and, has, uh, and, and, and will certainly have a propensity to dilate in the future. Um, this is a de vega annuloplasty, which is essentially is a circular uh, plication stitch around the annulus, which you place in this fashion and then cinch down. Uh, uh, this suffers from the same problem that the previous repair does, and that you are placing the stitch on that part of the annulus, which by, by its natural design is flexible. And so this has been shown to be not a durable way to achieve long-term um, uh, competence of the tricuspid valve, but it has the advantage of being very quick to do, and, and if you're very concerned about a patient's severe TR, certainly it'll help to get them through the immediate post-op period. This is uh, an example of a uh, reduction of, um, uh, of the annuloplasty using a flexible band. Now, when I say flexible, th that doesn't mean stretchable. This is a band that is flexible but, is not, but, but won't lengthen. In other words, if you pick a band of a, of a certain length and you, and you place it on the annulus, on this flexible portion of the annulus, uh, the band can twist, but it won't stretch. And so it actually serves as a very good way to preserve the tricuspid annular diameter uh, in that area. A more commonly used type of band uh, is a rigid band. And all of these, you see, have this gap in the middle uh, where you don't, uh, uh, which is in that zone between 6 o'clock and 9 o'clock um, uh, where there's a risk of injuring the AV node if you play stitches. This is a short video over here. 
on a patient who had a redo mitral valve replacement. And we're done with that part of the operation. Looking at the tricuspid valve now, you can see the Swan-Gans catheter going through the tricuspid annulus. Uh, I sized it, although I don't usually size it. I usually just put a 28 millimeter band in everybody, and place sutures around it, uh, avoiding that area from six o'clock to nine o'clock. <clears throat> you don't have to take the swan gans out because it fits very nicely through that gap in the band. Take the holder out and, and then secure the sutures down. You can tie them down, but in this example, I'm using a titanium knot fastener just because it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quicker. Now, in this, in this patient also had a prolapse of the posterior leaflet, so in addition to the ring, I went ahead and performed an, a, uh, an annuloplasty in that area, uh, um, uh, effectively creating a bicuspid valve. <clears throat> it's very difficult to create tricuspid stenosis. A 28 millimeter band appears to be like quite a you know, severe reduction from down from 40 or 50 millimeters, but in fact, it's very difficult uh, to, uh, to create tricuspid stenosis. This study from the Cleveland Clinic are, using, uh, are looking at different types of repair basically showed that if you did a uh, De Vega annuloplasty or used a pericardial strip, which has the ability to stretch, uh, you didn't get as durable a pair as if you used a flexible band or a rigid ring. So, uh, last couple of slides. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, before I show you a sort of summary slide from the guidelines, is to point out that when you're looking at the guidelines, a class one recommendation is a strong recommendation a class 2A is a moderate recommendation where the benefit is likely to be uh, significantly more than the risk. Class 2B is a weak recommendation. So when you look at the recommendations for um, uh, um, surgical repair of functional tricuspid regurgitation that are currently in the guidelines, uh, the only two class one recommendations really are for asymptomatic severe tricuspid regurgitation at the time of left-sided valve surgery and for symptomatic severe tricuspid regurgitation at the time of left-sided valve surgery. If you have symptomatic severe tricuspid regurgitation and you don't need to have valve surgery, then the recommendation for a primary fix is a 2A recommendation. Uh, this is sort of a schematic of, uh, of the broad outline that I use and I think many surgeons use uh, in their practice. If the patient's got moderate or severe TR on the, on the preoperative echo, it says intraop or preoperative, really should be the preoperative echo because the intraop echo is frequently misleading as the patient's unloaded under anesthetic conditions and you can have less TR than the patient really has under normal conditions. But if they have significant um, uh, TR, uh, then we would go ahead and do a, uh, a, a tricuspid annuloplasty. If they don't, but they have annular dilatation, then we'd go ahead and do a tricuspid annuloplasty. If they don't have a dilated annulus or they don't have significant uh, TR, by which I mean greater than 2 plus TR, we'd leave it alone. Thank you. Thank you, Mahesh. That was a tour de force.